19 deaths every minute for six years of the World War. Numbers and statistics like that are an excellent way to gain at least a partial understanding of otherwise incomprehensible phenomena, whether it be because of their sheer magnitude or their astonishing complexity. In the case of World War II, it's, it's both. A conflict on an unfathomable scale intertwined with an almost inconceivable degree of complexity. Today, we will break some of it down into numbers, which are sometimes more effective than anything else in showing the true scale of things. I'm Indy Nidell, and this is a World War II in Numbers epilogue special. And I'm Spartacus Olson. Let us begin with the name World War, which implies that the conflict engulfs the entire world. While this is not literally true, World War II certainly left its mark on most of the world. Of the 64 or 72, depending whom you ask, sovereign states that existed on Earth in 1945, 21 decided to remain neutral, with all others at various times from 1939 to 1945 either joining the Allied or the Axis side. In total, around 127 million people were mobilized to fight for king and country, folk and Führer, Uncle Sam, or the proletariat, right? By percent of the world's population in 1939, this is between five and six percent of all humans on Earth. Compare that to the latest data we have of the 2024 world. Roughly 27 million individuals comprise all the world's armed forces. That's just 0.3% of today's population. So, if you took all of today's military personnel, then doubled that, and then doubled it again, you'd still be 19 million men, or one Romania, short. One Romania is a number. It is. You count 16 million, 17 million, 18 million, Romania, 20 million. Okay, okay, I, I didn't know that. Oh, but hey, hey, okay, China, the largest military force in terms of manpower today has around 2,035,000 individuals, right? Trust me. So on top of doubling the number of all military personnel around the world twice, you'd need around nine 2024 Chinese armies on top of that to reach the number of people mobilized during World War II if you don't count in Romania's. Which you do. The largest group of these 127 million men were the Soviets, with 35.4 million of them fighting for Mother Russia throughout the war. By 1945, they alone had put more men in the field than all of the European Axis powers combined. Next in line are the Germans, who sent 18.1 million people to war, meaning that 42% of all German males were mobilized, which is the highest percentage across all warring nations. After that comes the once sleeping giant, the USA, who after awakening assembled 16.3 million individuals for the war. Then comes China with 14 million, Japan with 9.1 million, Britain with roughly 5.9 million, France with 5 million, Italy with somewhere around 4 million. The sources vary a lot there though. India with 2.5 million, the largest volunteer force in history, and Poland with 2 million, making up the 10 nations which mobilized the most people in absolute terms. It's also important to remember that while the majority of these mobilized people were men, roughly one in 25 were women. Another thing you can see from the numbers is that for every one Axis soldier, there were roughly two Allied soldiers. Whether for Lebensraum, for their superior race, to establish themselves as the regional power or in defense against either or both of these goals, mankind harnessed all the destructive capabilities at its disposal on land, in the skies, on and beneath the seas. Let's start where most of the actual fighting took place, on the ground and between infantrymen. The major powers alone, that's the US, the USSR, Britain, Germany, and Japan, produced some 40.8 million rifles and carbines, 13.3 million machine pistols and submachine guns, SMGs, and 6.7 million machine guns. Of these, the United States and the USSR produced by far the most. In rifles, they produced around 12 million each, with the US taking a slight lead. The Germans follow them with roughly 10 million, Japan with 3.5 million, and then Britain with 2.5 million. There is much debate about which rifle was the most produced in the war. Unfortunately, there is no clear answer to this question. 
the Mauser 98K, of which somewhere around 14 million were produced between 1935 and 1945, is certainly among the top contenders, and one of the most widely used rifles during the war. On to submachine guns. Here first place is clearly the Soviet Union making around 6 million SMGs, most of which were the PPSH-41, the most produced SMG of the war, with roughly 5 million being produced by its end. The Soviets are followed by the British with 3.9 million. Yep, the Brits built more submachine guns than rifles. That's pretty much only because of the Sten gun, which is easily manufacturable and most importantly, very, very cheap. In 1942, a Sten gun would run you roughly $11, while a Tommy gun could cost as much as $70. Next in line is the US with 1.9 million, followed by Germany with 1.3 million. The last place by a long shot is Japan with, wow. wait, let me see here, 8,000? Japan only produced 8,000 SMGs from 1939 to 1945? Yes, they did. It illustrates the different strategies and tactics each country deployed. And evidently, Japan did not think much of SMGs, but they had a shit ton of swords. Now, unfortunately, I don't have exact numbers on this, but every junior officer was equipped with a katana. Last but not least, we have machine guns. Here, the order is different yet again. The US is first with 2.6 million, followed by the Soviets with 1.5 million, and then the Germans with 1.2 million, roughly speaking. Right. Next is Britain with 940,000, and last is Japan with 451,000. But, but battles on land are not only fought with rifles, submachine guns, machine guns, and katanas. We're missing the literal big guns, the tanks, the self-propelled guns, SPGs, and artillery pieces of all varieties. In total, somewhere around 283,000 tanks and SPGs were produced by the major powers. Just to show you how mind-boggling that amount is, today, there are like 73,000 tanks spread around the entire world, with maybe 60,000 in active service. Add to that an estimated 33,725 SPGs, and you get maybe 100,000 active service vehicles, give or take. Now, today's vehicles may be more resource intensive and harder to produce, but manufacturing capabilities at the time were also limited compared to today. Yeah. So yeah, the comparison isn't perfect, but it's still pretty solid. This means, that the Soviet Union alone outproduced today's entire world tank and SPG supply during the war, building 103,000 or so in six years. And Uncle Sam was around there too, producing about 99,000. Far, far behind these two industrial juggernauts comes the Germans with 46,000, then the British with 29,000. Japan is last with just under 5,000. Just think about that for a minute. The USSR and the US each produced over twice as many tanks as the Germans. Sure, some of the German tanks individually were very capable, but it is always important to remember that quantity is a quality of its own. Okay. Look at it this way. The Soviets produced 40,000 T-34 variants, and the US produced over 48,000 Shermans. Against that, 9,000 German Panzer IVs or 10,000 Stug III tank destroyers seems really outmatched. Even if we take perhaps the most famous tank of World War II, the German Tiger, we get somewhere around 1,300 made between 1942 and 1945. So even if every single Tiger tank took on 35 Sherman tanks each, that would still leave out 2,500 Shermans. What about artillery? Well, a similar, although slightly different picture emerges here. Out of the nearly 1.9 million artillery pieces produced, the US and USSR once again produced by far the most. Together, they produced more than half of the total, with the US manufacturing 549,000 and the Soviets 481,000. The British produced 389,000, the Germans 320,000, and the Japanese 159,000. The most produced artillery piece is likely the Soviet ZIS-3 field gun, which was made more than 100,000 times, according to some sources. But let's stop looking at the ground and let's gaze up to the skies. World War II was the first war in which airplanes, primarily bombers and fighters, really played a decisive role. In terms of total production numbers, those five powers built 558,000 combat aircraft. 
Compare that with somewhere north of 145,000 planes built by all participants during the First World War. This underlines the heightened importance of and increased emphasis on air warfare during World War II. Once more, the US produced the most, and this time, it was by a truly remarkable margin. Uncle Sam churned out 192,000 planes. The next in line, the Soviet Union only, managed to make about 112,000. Britain is relatively close with 94,000, followed by the Germans with 89,000, and last Japan with 55,000. Once more, we have a familiar trend here that we see across all statistics. The Axis falling behind in production. If we compare the total number of combat airplanes on either side, we get a ratio of 2.5 Allied planes for every one Axis. Then there are also facts like that the US produced more planes in 1944 alone than Japan did during the entire war. But what was the most produced airplane of World War II. Ah, I'm gonna stop you there. Maybe you were right, but I'm gonna stop you anyway. It's the Ilyushin IL-2, the Soviet's extremely reliable ground support plane of choice, nicknamed the Flying Tank or the Hunchback because of its rugged and sturdy design. More than 36,000 of these with variants were produced. For your information, mm -hmm. the IL-2 is not just the most produced plane of World War II, it's the single most produced military aircraft in history. And if the Cessna 172 didn't exist, then it'd also take the general title of most produced plane, period. However, in a close second, we have the at first feared and then later obsolete workhorse of the Luftwaffe, the Messerschmitt BF-109, with a total wartime production run of 30,000 or more from the E to K variants. It is the most produced fighter plane of the Second World War. Put this into contrast with its two most common opponents, the Spitfire, with just over 20,000 produced, and the P-51 Mustang, with just under 15,000 also across all variants. The Germans also did have another fighter, which they produced in the tens of thousands, the Focke-Wulf 190, with roughly 20,000 built between 1939 and 1945. And in the Pacific, the Japanese produced close to 10,500 Mitsubishi A6M Zeros. Heavy bombers are another story, and the most produced one was the consolidated B-24 Liberator, the Flying Coffin, with nearly 18,500 made. In Europe, B-24s together with the other Allied bombers released somewhere around 2.7 million tons of bombs over Axis territory and occupied territory in nearly 1.5 million sorties, with slightly more than half of that payload hitting Germany itself. Just to wrap your head around it, that's 450,000 African elephants or 267 Eiffel Towers in weight. Do you think we can wrap our heads around how much 267 Eiffel Towers weigh? Or 450,000 African elephants. Okay. How old are the elephants? <laughs> uh, anyhow, anyhow, okay. We've looked at the land, we've looked at the sky. Let's head out to sea. Here, the Second World War also brought industrial output on a scale never before seen. And here, there is a clear leader in terms of production capacity. Of the total number of 11,500 or so major naval vessels. Yeah, but by the way, major naval vessels are everything up from a destroyer, including submarines. Okay, thank you. Right. Of them, the United States alone produced nearly 9,000. That's more than three times the combined number of all other powers, Axis and Allied. This clearly shows the industrial might of the United States, more so than the statistics for small arms, tanks, or airplanes. Who comes next? Depends. As you can imagine, finding reliable data on all this can be tricky, and sometimes there are contradictory sources as is the case here. Britain produced almost 1,200 vessels in Germany, between 950 and 1,200, depending on whom you ask. Japan comes next with close to 600, and last is the USSR with 161. However, there are winners and losers here. One type of ship experienced an apotheosis, while another marched towards obsolescence. We're talking about battleships and airplane carriers. Aircraft carriers. Can't do it without a smile. Airplane carriers. I know I know people call them aircraft carriers, but it's actually the same thing when you think about it, right? Uh, like if you could be beheaded, you could be be-bodied. 
Well, like yeah, he would, ah, he was be no, body. That's not the same thing. <laughs> it's an airplane carrier. It's <laughs> World War II. What yeah. other aircraft are airplane carriers carrying? Well, there weren't any helicopters. So no, see say that? Zeppelins. No, no, they we're not carrying zeppelins. Okay, well, of course they were carrying okay. zeppelins. Look, they were carrying balloons. No, you carry, carry on, carry on. Okay, <laughs> aircraft carriers, right? Okay. Anyway, it sounds weird, but to illustrate, before 1939, Britain had seven carriers, the U.S. six, and Japan five. By 1945, Japan had built 18 additional ones. Britain 53, and the U.S. a whopping. 107. Yes, we have included light or escort carriers in these numbers, as there is no objective definition of what a heavy or fleet and light carrier is. But compare that to battleships. In 1939, the U.S. had 15 active battleships. In 1945, they had 23. Okay, that's still more, but that's not the interesting part. That comes five years later. In 1950, the U.S. had one active battleship while still having 15 active carriers. This shows, really shows the paradigm shift in naval doctrine quite clearly. Uh, nevertheless, the largest and heaviest ship taken into active service during World War II is one of those behemoths. The Japanese battleship Yamato, with a weight of up to 72,000 metric tons, a weight mm -hmm. that is still awe-striking today, although heavier naval and civilian vessels have been built since 1945. We cannot talk about naval numbers during World War II and not mention landing craft, freighters, and other non-military vessels. In an effort to supply Britain against the German submarine Wolfpacks, the US churned out like 5,500 ships 2,700 of which were Liberty ships, quickly produced freight liners. Uh, similarly, to facilitate the D-Day landing or succeed in the island hopping campaign against Japan, U.S. industry spat out almost 24,000 LCVPs, landing craft, vehicle, personnel. Remember, this is on top of the figures we just discussed. Turning out millions of small arms, hundreds of thousands of tanks, SPGs, and artillery pieces, tens of thousands of airplanes, and thousands of major ships required an economic and industrial commitment never before seen on Earth. Let us begin with the figures at the start, using data from 1938. We can see that the Allies' combined GDP is somewhere above $3.9 trillion, whereas the combined Axis stands somewhere close to $1.7 trillion, giving us an Allied advantage of roughly 2.4 to 1 in terms of GDP. Yep, what is more fascinating that is fascinating, but what is more fascinating is how this disparity develops throughout the war. Check out the numbers from 1941. Allied GDP was around 4.3 trillion, higher than before, and the Axis GDP was almost 2.2 trillion, half a trillion higher. What explains this development? Well, the course of the war. France is knocked out of it, Germany has annexed or occupied territory and industrial capacity all over Europe, and large parts of the Soviet economy are damaged or taken by the Germans in the early stages of Operation Barbarossa. In spite of all this, though, the ratio is still firmly in the Allies' favor, two to one. And from here on out, it would never even sway towards the Axis' favor again. In 1942, it's 2.1 to one. 1943, almost 2.5 to 1. 1944, 3.3 to 1. And finally, in 1945, it is 5.1 to 1. But what percentage of national income went to the war effort? In 1939, the U.S. only spent a measly 1% of national income on military expenditures. Makes sense with the U.S. not being part of the war and all. Comparatively, Britain is already at 15%, and the Axis takes the lead with 22% in the case of Japan and 23% in the case of Germany. If you're wondering where the USSR comes in, we don't have such data for them in 1939. 1940 presents a radically changed picture. Well, not for all. Okay, not for the US and for Japan, for example. The US sits at 2% and Japan remains at 22%. This still makes sense. The US is not part of the war and Japan is only fighting a regional war against China not a global one, but a big change for Britain and Germany, who spend 44 and 40% of national income on the war that year. At this point though, these are the only two big powers fighting each other after the fall of France, the Benelux countries, Norway and Denmark. In the meantime, the USSR sits at 17% after having occupied parts of Poland and fighting the Finns in the Winter War. 1941 changes everything. 
In a flash, everybody enters, or rather is, entered into the war, with Barbarossa and Pearl Harbor making sure of that. Germany and Britain now both spend over 50% of their income on the war effort, with 52 and 53. The USA more than quintuples its military spending, reaching 11% by the end of the year. Japan also spends more, going up to 27%, and the USSR goes to 28%. Now, I'm gonna skip 1942 and 1943 and go straight to 1944. By now, the sleeping giant has truly awoken, and even the US spends between 42 and 45% of its income to defeat the Axis. In Britain, not that much has changed here, 55%. The Soviet Union has overtaken the Western Allies with 61%, and, well, the eventual losers try the hardest, with both Germany and Japan spending over 70% of their income on an increasingly desperate struggle. Overall, it is estimated that the whole war costs the world $4.85 trillion in 2024 money. If you spend $1 million every day, it would take you almost 13,300 years to reach that figure. So you'd start spending a million dollars a day long before real human civilization began until today, or, or with that money you could buy 78 million kilos of gold, almost eight times the amount that has been mined since, well, ever. But really, $4.85 trillion. Spent on what? Utter devastation, unimaginable agony, and unrivaled despair, death, and destruction on a scale the world has never seen before and hopefully will never see again. Of the hundreds of thousands of gleaming new planes that were built to conquer the sky, most plunged back to the earth, either in bullet-ridden carcasses of aluminium, glass, and steel, or as shattered wrecks from mechanical failures, training mishaps, or the unforgiving forces of nature. Germany lost as much as 92% of its combat planes, the USSR 78%, and Britain just 23.4%. While we do not have these percentages for US and Japanese combat aircraft, we do know the US lost roughly 30% of all airplanes produced, and Japan 45%. The instruments of destruction set to command the battle on land fared little better. The Soviets lost almost as many tanks and SPGs during the war as they were able to produce, 96,500 or so. The Germans, some 67,500 tanks and SPGs. Britain lost almost 16,000 tanks. And the US, 11,000 tanks and SPGs. Japan lost 3,000. Likewise, many of the steel colossi sent to dominate the seas also failed their mission, being dragged into the sea's dark depths. Excluding landing craft, torpedo boats, and other auxiliary craft and the like, the US lost 184 major vessels, Britain lost 295, Japan 328, the USSR 659, and the Germans 805. Inside or on all these machines of death were humans, as were the infantrymen that charged the enemy or the civilians behind the front lines. Somewhere between 21 and 25.5 million soldiers perished in six years. More than 20 million people, with hopes and dreams, loved ones and friends, removed from existence. The Soviets suffered the most military deaths, 6.75 million. The main aggressor in Europe also paid a hefty price. Nearly 4.5 million Germans died in the name of the Fuhrer. 105 per hour, every hour, every day, for six years. Likewise, the Japanese also paid dearly for their attacks in December 1941, with 2.3 million deaths. Although Japan lost fewer men than their first opponent in the war, China, with 3.75 million military deaths. Military deaths is one thing. Civilians are another. The civilian deaths outnumbered the military ones by more than two to one, with 29 million to 30.5 million dying as a result of military actions and war crimes, and another 19 million to 28 million from war-related famine and or disease. So as a result of the war, between 48 and 58.5 million civilians laid down their lives. 
The reasons for their deaths vary. Roughly 17 million people ceased to exist in the Nazis' racist attacks on humanity itself, suffocating in the gas chambers, shot in the head and buried in a mass grave, starving on a death march, and so on. In Europe, between 570,000 and 800,000 German civilians died from the Allied strategic bombing offensive. In Japan, the numbers ranged pretty widely from 330,000 to 900,000, including those that perished in the two military deployments of atomic bombs. In Britain, roughly 60,000 were killed from above, and the list of death goes on, country by country, method by method. Poland lost almost 20% of its population, and the Soviet Union lost close to 15% of its, and saw 25% of all national wealth destroyed compared to 1940. The South Sea's mandate, made up of the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, the Northern Mariana Islands, and the Palaus, lost 48% of its population. At the end of this indescribable butchery and slaughter, between 70 and 85 million people lay dead, three to 3.7% of the entire world population. That is precisely why we here at Time Ghost make this content, to open the eyes of anyone willing to learn of the horror and the depths of despair that the Second World War brought to millions upon millions of people so that it will hopefully never be repeated. When Looking at the statistics, it is easy to be awestruck by the ingenious engineering or manufacturing behind some of these machines we discussed, or stupefied by the sheer number of them produced in just six years. In the end, the only figure that matters is that of the dead. And it is because of you out there, the Time Ghost Army, that we can continue this mission. You enable us to learn and to help others learn about these events of our past. But, but we don't just toil in the past. We work for the future. If you want to be part of this mission, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Go ahead, say it. Never forget. Never forget.